You are tuned to CFTO TV Channel 9 in Toronto Cable 8. The CTV National News with Richard Brown. Good evening. A huge cloud of poisonous gas hangs over a small town in Sweden tonight, and police have ordered all residents off the streets. The gas leak began this afternoon at the Bullforce Chemical Works when a pipe burst in a storage tank. The plant produces chemicals and explosives. The 35,000 residents of Karlskoga, 240 kilometers west of Stockholm, have been told to stay inside and close all windows and doors. Authorities are fearful the thick white cloud will drift over heavily populated residential areas. Ten plant workers have been injured, 300 residents have been evacuated, and more than 100 residents have been admitted to emergency centers for treatment. The poisonous gas is called oleum. It's a corrosive gas derived from sulfuric acid and can be fatal in high concentrations. The gas is still leaking and experts can't get close enough to stop it. Plant spokesmen say oleum isn't as dangerous as the methyl isocyanate that leaked from a Union Carbide plant in Bhopal, India last month, but police in Karlskoga have closed all access roads in and out of town. Canada's Defence Minister, Robert Coates, had to put his wagons in a circle today. He denied knowing anything about U.S. contingency plans for deploying nuclear weapons in Canada. Those plans were revealed yesterday in a leaked Pentagon document. They show that in the event of nuclear war, the U.S. would move 32 atomic devices to Canadian bases. Robert Hurst has more. Defense Minister Coates says he's going to find out if the Pentagon document is true. I've never been consulted on it. I really am not in any position uh, to talk about it. The U.S. government has a policy against discussing the authenticity of leaked documents, but the State Department did say this. I can assure you that no nuclear weapons would be stationed in Canada or in any, any other NATO ally without strict conformity with appropriate NATO plans and procedures and the prior agreement of the host government. Independent Canadian defense experts say the deployment of a few nuclear bombs would only be a small part of Canada's involvement during a crisis. The NORAD treaty commits Canada to defend North America, but analysts point out that Canada alone could not defend against a military buildup or against an attack coming across the North Pole. Independent defense analysts say the most likely and obvious responses are these. USA WAC surveillance planes would be moved into the high Arctic. The NORAD underground fort at North Bay, Ontario would become a northern command post. Interceptors like the CF-18 and the US F-15 would be deployed. These are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. B-52 attack bombers would be the next step, and these do carry atomic weapons. These US planes would be fueled, serviced, and loaded at existing Canadian bases on the east and west coasts and in the high Arctic. There's little doubt that war plans are constantly being discussed by military officials in both Washington and Ottawa. But it's important to point out these are only contingency plans. Canada's long-standing policy remains no nuclear weapons on Canadian soil. The last ones were removed seven months ago. Robert Hurst, CTV News, Ottawa. But it was conventional weaponry that was on the minds of Canadian military experts today. An array of what's available was on display in Ottawa for Canadian defense buyers. Bob Evans reports. The cost of this one Canadian-made anti-tank round is nearly $1,000, but it looks like good value for your money. Or perhaps this portable one-man multiple rocket launcher to bring down low-flying airplanes. The price is classified, but the British manufacturer promises a hit. Airplanes never come in ones, they usually come in threes or fours, so we're at least able to take out a couple of the attack pattern. These are some of the choices facing the Canadian military. Which air defense system will the government buy to re-equip Canadian troops in Europe? And how much do these items cost? This Canadian-made surveillance drone, for instance. It's, it costs much less than a tank, for instance, or uh, some sophisticated missile systems. It's much less expensive than that. Delegates to the annual conference of Canadian defense associations recognize that no single Western nation is wealthy enough to produce all its own weapons that there is growing need among NATO countries for shared defense contracts. Canada's defense minister told them this country's industrial base will be strengthened, not only to create jobs, but to help the defense effort. A healthy economy allows for a larger defense budget. Therefore, if the economy is invigorated, there will be, this will be good for defense as well as for Canada. Everyone here hopes the two superpowers will agree to slow and finally end their nuclear arms race. They will then be able to turn their attention to what looks like the next problem, 
the conventional arms race. Bob Evans, CTV News, Ottawa. Senior U.S. officials were in Ottawa today to brief External Affairs Minister Joe Clark on this week's arms control talks in Geneva. Clark described the outcome of the talks as an important step forward. He also said Canada will continue to play a role in the search for a durable, effective and verifiable arms control agreement between the two superpowers. An agreement is in sight for unity in Cyprus. Greek and Turkish Cypriot leaders are reported to agree on a two-state federation. The Greeks would dominate the central government, but the Turks would have a veto, and the Turks would make land concessions. There is still a lot to settle, and the summit meeting will be held in New York a week from today. At least eight people were killed today in London when a gas explosion tore through a luxury apartment building. One woman was trapped in the rubble for more than seven hours before firemen digging with their hands pulled her out alive. More from Jim Munson. This is what firemen discovered when they arrived on the scene. The blast had such force that it blew out both sides of the building. Moments before the explosion took place, residents had already complained to the gas board about a strong odor. The building superintendent had just finished delivering the mail to one of the tenants. I said to her, I said, there's a terrible smell in there. It says, yes, Dutchess, and I fold the gas board up. As I left the building, went back into the estate office, I put the key in the door, went inside, boom, everything went up in the air. The blast was so strong that it blew out windows a hundred yards away. Firemen desperately searched for survivors. As the morning dragged on, their spirits sagged when all they found were bodies. But two hours after the explosion, firemen detected a sign of life. We believe we've heard sounds of knocking from under the debris on the far side. A woman who was in her bathroom fell three stories. The firemen were painstakingly trying to get her out. We started off, we just found a foot and we gradually worked up the body. And then we found a hand and we sort of held a hand just to reassure her and just gradually worked her way in, yeah. Finally, four hours later, she was rescued. The 35-year-old woman's back and legs are broken. Despite her pain, she was conscious enough to ask about her sister who is in the adjoining room. Later in the afternoon, more bodies were pulled from the carnage. Hours after the blast occurred, firemen were still sifting through the rubble. In the meantime, the government's health and safety branch has launched an inquiry into this tragic incident. Jim Munson, CTV News, London. Dr. Henry Morgenthaler and his associate, Dr. Robert Scott, have been ordered to stand trial again on abortion-related charges. Morgenthaler was in provincial court in Toronto today, where the judge ordered a trial date to be set next week. The two doctors face charges of conspiring to procure a miscarriage, the same charge they were acquitted of last November. The Crown is appealing that acquittal, and Morgenthaler's supporters want the new charges quashed. New get-tough legislation to deal with prostitution will have high priority when Parliament resumes. That commitment was made today by Energy Minister Pat Carney in response to continuing complaints from her Vancouver constituents. Despite some success using the courts in British Columbia to deal with the problem, Carney says new prostitution laws are needed. Del Archer reports. Prostitution is a public nuisance in British Columbia. That's what a B.C. Supreme Court judge ruled last July when he issued an injunction that effectively stopped soliciting in Vancouver's notorious West End. The hookers got the message and moved to an adjacent warehouse district where they now compete for space and customers. Similar court injunctions have been sought in other Canadian cities, notably Halifax, without success. Most of Vancouver's hookers were and still are operating on the streets in Federal Energy Minister Pat Carney's writing. The Energy Minister isn't happy about any of this and says the federal government is going to move quickly to live up to its election campaign promise and introduce new legislation to clean up the streets. Which would charge the customer as well as the prostitute and which would really apply to offers to sell and offers to purchase sexual services on the street. But the Vancouver lawyer who regularly and successfully defends prostitutes against various anti-hooker bills says a new law isn't necessary. Tony Circus says enforcement of the criminal code section as it's now written is all that's necessary. If it is enforced, it will control prostitution. It, it's, it's ludicrous to try to stamp out prostitution. What you want to do is control it. Circa also says the government shouldn't even consider changing the law until it reviews the recommendations of the Fraser Commission's inquiry into prostitution. He says it shouldn't matter that the inquiry was ordered by a liberal government and that if the report is ignored, it will have been a complete waste of time and taxpayers' money. Del Archer, CTV News, Vancouver. At the Los Angeles Olympics, the U.S. cycling team won more medals than any team before it. 
Now the team doctor has revealed that some cyclists received blood transfusions before they competed in hopes of increasing their endurance. It has raised doubts about medal-winning performances that made them heroes just five months ago. Jerry Bowen reports. The American cycling team was really pumped up for the summer games. A third of its members reportedly pumped up by transfusions of additional blood in the belief that the extra oxygen-carrying red cells would improve endurance. The practice is known as blood boosting or blood doping. And the week before the games, a number of team members went to this motel to receive their transfusions from a team doctor with the approval of the team's coach. It did look kind of bad and kind of scary too, but you know, when you're... When you